give the evening. Um, the candidates have drawn names. We've agreed that I can refer to them by their first names. We have Bobby, Bo, and Mark. And we have selected the order of all of the events that are going to go on tonight. We will start with a five-minute introduction. Candidates, if you'd like to take your places down there. Each candidate will begin with five minutes to introduce themselves. Then we'll have a series of three questions. The question will go to one candidate for three minutes. The other candidates will have two minutes to respond to those questions. After that first series of three questions that were selected by me, we'll have a 10 minute break. And during that break, I will select the next three questions out of the questions that have been put in the bag in the back. Does anybody have any questions before we proceed? All right, thank you. Let's be respectful. I, I am a punctual person, and if we go by my schedule, we should be out here by 7 p.m. So according to the way we started, uh, you have the first five minutes to introduce yourself. Give me just a moment to get my timer going.
So I intend on addressing that in a very, very equitable way as well. Next one is the housing aspect, and I do have some serious housing programs that are put into effect. And hopefully, one or two of the questions have come up to present it to us. I'll be able to address it a little bit further. But my business experience what qualifies me. I've been the National Draft for American Indians for 15 years, dealing with government to government issues, being flown around the country to speak on diversity issues. I set up a program in Canada, throughout the United States, and in Mexico as well. So I'm very, very well, I would say, a seasoned individual in this position. Thank you. Next uh, is Bo. Go ahead, Bo. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to address. I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you know, we have, um, like I said, I would say the was in a lifelong resident of Forestville, Raymond, and others. Been there 40 years. My children all graduated from Yosemite High School. Uh, I've got eight children total. Uh, seven of them graduated from Yosemite High School, and one decided to go to Everett. And uh, it was my only son, seven girls in a row, my son was a boy. So uh, I guess he was pretty close to school. Um, but at any rate, I'm a, uh, as you can tell, I wear a cowboy hat sometimes. Can you hear me? Okay. There you go. There you go. I am. Uh, I wear a cowboy hat. I wear cowboy boots because I am a rancher. Uh, that's what I've done. Uh, my family's been here close to 45 years, and that's what my father did primarily when he came to the valley. Um, I just recently inherited it uh, full time myself and my wife. She told me uh, when. Uh, I don't know, about our 40th anniversary after we had had all of the dogs and puppies and cats and all of that. And she said, no more animals. She said, you can't even have a goldfish, you can't have a parakeet. We inherited about 150 head of cattle, and that's what her and I take care of every day. So we're, we're, we're pretty busy doing that. But um, I've been a real estate broker. Uh, I was one of the youngest real estate brokers. Well, I was an agent primarily. But I got my license when I was 18 years of, of age. I was one of the youngest agents in the state of California. Uh, it was back in 1979 or 80. And uh, recently got my broker's license. So uh, that's what I did primarily. I'm also a licensed general contractor. And between my father and myself, uh, we built a lot of buildings. And I, you know, it's just kind of remarkable. Okay, it's kind of remarkable, you know, I, I, he recently passed. And uh, it's one of those things where, you know, it's almost like sleepwalking. We were building and, you know, he was growing and, you know, acquiring this and acquiring that. And I was right alongside him. And I, it was amazing to me, you know, what he had accomplished. Um, but it's all, you know, pretty much a lot of it was uh, here in uh, the county of Madera. And uh, we, uh, like I said, we, uh, I raised my family. I made a conscious choice. Um, I started. Back in, well, my wife and I got married in 1978, San Jose, California, and I headed off to Oregon State. I stayed there a couple of years, decided Oregon wasn't for me. It was a beautiful country. I came back and I came to San Jose. San Jose began to grow in a way that I wasn't comfortable with, and uh, we were quite naturally priced out of the housing market early on. So we left the game before school. We bought a piece of property in the Lakes Park and we started building our house. Um, I, I, I thought it was a great place, and you know, after 40 years, I know that it was the right place for me because we're still here. Can't see that. Minute 30 left. But I, uh, I'm here before you guys. I am running for supervisor, and uh, I would appreciate the opportunity to serve you as the next supervisor uh, in 2022. So. Thank you. So I've been told that you really have to kind of eat the mic if you yes. want to be heard, so I'm going to do my best to, to get it up here and make sure everyone hears. Um, but Sally, thank you for being here. Thank you for moderating. Uh, Joe, thank you for hosting us here at the, uh, uh, the community center. And thank you, Bonnie, uh, Diane, Liz, um, and, and
Sports Aurora for putting this all together. Um, you know, it's organizations like the Community Center, organizations like the Chamber, uh, Corsable Stampede, that really make commun uh, communities like Corsable great. And so I've had a great time working with a number of organizations like these over the last decade. And as supervisor, I'm excited to continue working with them, ensuring that they have the tools and support they need to deliver their mission, because that's how we make this the best community to live, work, and play. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Bobby McCauley. I was born and raised here in the mountain communities of Madera County. Graduated from Yosemite Unified High School. Uh, worked my way through college where I received degrees in managerial economics as well as business administration. Uh, after college, I got a great job working as a, a regional manager for a small restaurant chain. But about a decade ago, I decided to move home, get involved with my family's insurance brokerage. And it was really there that I kind of discovered what it was that I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a public servant. I wanted to get involved with my community. I wanted to help folks that needed uh, assistance and make sure that our community remained a great place to live, work, and play. So there as an insurance broker, I had the opportunity to get involved with a number of organizations, including our local area Boys and Girls Club. I say area because I'm happy to say that this summer we'll be expanding programming throughout the mountain communities in Madera County, which is an awesome thing. Um, organization's been around for about 20 years, but just recently have we been able to spread our wings and, and get out into the outlying communities. Also involved in the Oakhurst, uh, Oakhurst Community Center, uh, the MD22A Sewer Advisory Group, the Eastern Madera County Foundation, uh, and our local area of Rotary Club. As I said earlier, these are the organizations that make our mountain community great, and so I'm excited to continue supporting them. Um, Shortly thereafter, though, I decided to elevate what I was doing and really get involved in the community, and I felt there was no better place to do so than working at the county. So I got a job working as a District 5 Chief of Staff uh, for residents here in the area. So I've been working there for about three years, had the opportunity to get to know how the county works, um, but more importantly, what does it work? You know, where we need to be focusing our efforts and ensuring that the county does a better job providing services to residents in the area. And so where I think about where we need to focus our efforts, uh, for me it's public safety. And, and when I think about public safety, I'm really talking about fire. You know, last November I had the opportunity to meet with uh, the supervisor that oversaw the town of Greenville. And for those of you that don't know, you know Greenville was lost in the Dixon fire. The town was completely wiped out. And very easily, Corsicle could have been that community last year in the river fire. North Fork could have been that community the year before um, in the creek fire. It could have been my parents' home back in 2015 when the junction fire rolled over Hodges Hill. So fire is a very real concern. And as your supervisor, it will be my top priority because I see addressing risks of catastrophic wildfire as being the most important issue for our community. Because when we address this issue, we're able to create more good paying jobs, we're able to protect our housing market, we're able to take a stab at addressing the insurance crisis. And so that's my number one priority. And so I want to leave you all with this. You know, I've been campaigning for about 500 days now. I started February of 2021 because I wanted people to know that I was, what my intentions were. I wanted to be transparent with what I was doing. And so at that time, I had a conversation with my mentor, um, my best friend, Billy. My dad, uh, and what he told me was just make sure that you're genuine, that people know you can. And so tonight, I hope that you all see that in our conversations throughout this debate and in conclusion. So um, thank you all. I appreciate you all being here. Looking forward to some more conversations. I'll be here after the debate ends. So if anybody wants to chat, ask me some hard questions, I'll be here um, looking forward to it.
And then Bobby will have two minutes to respond, and then Mark will have two minutes to respond. So Bo, the majority of the tax uh, income that comes into Madera County comes from District 5. And how do you see yourself interacting with the other supervisors if you're elected to make sure that District 5 gets its fair share of the revenue and the services back from the county? <clears throat> I think one of the, the main things that I, I kind of uh, picked this up when I decided I was going to run was, you know, you have forged alliances with uh, people, and you know, it's, sometimes it's, you know, they're, they're people you don't necessarily agree with, um, but it's necessary to shoulder up with them to get a specific um, uh, thing that you might need. And, you know, being a resident here, I know that that's been the concern of everybody's. Uh, they talk about forming special districts and, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it is a uh, very bad problem. You know, we, all the money that we do have, I guess it does go down the hill and doesn't come back. I made a promise to you know, a couple of guys that were running. Well, one guy's running. I said, you know, you, you're in district, whatever it was he's running for, and I'm in this district, you know, and I said, when it comes time for us to vote, I said, you know, uh, let's, you know, let, let's vote in accordance to, you know, what we need. And, you know, my constituents, yes, we need more funding. You know, I, I wanted to do uh, a hospital up here. I think a lot of people up here, you know, there are a lot of seniors, uh, and everybody says, well, how are you gonna do that, you know? Well, part of it is uh, reallocation of funds. Uh, everybody's talking about fires, and they're talking about the uh, yeah, the, the uh, fire stations uh, being funded. I think uh, Mark mentioned there was six. I understood there was eight, five of them were unfunded, uh, were unmanned. And uh, part of it is, uh, I think, you know, we have priorities. And our priorities are not, they're not the same as the ones uh, in the valley. And I think that, person that's been around here and kind of watched and like I tell people, I go from Shaver all the way to Coulterville, all these back roads, I've seen it, and they all look the same. They all look the same, okay? And uh, we've, we've got a consistent problem and it's the fires and, you know, that's, I think that's, that's what we need to do. We need to get those dollars back up here to get the fire departments up so that they can help us in our time of need. That's it. All right, thank you. Bobby, you have uh, two minutes to respond. So in short, it's hard work, it's planning, and it's comprehension. Without these three things, all our dollars go to the valley. And so we need to have a better understanding of how our dollars are being spent, how they're going to the state, and they're coming back to us in different programs. And we need to do a better job of planning to ensure that we have systems that work for Eastern Madera County. So that way we can address the unique needs of all 16 communities, individual, unique communities that exist within our district. And so as your supervisor, I don't think any candidate up here tonight is gonna to have a better understanding of the systems down at the county, how the funding works, and how we can do a better job of bringing those funds up the hill. We're already doing it. I can tell you right now, Last fall, we were able to bring up 600, excuse me, $500,000 in funding to help supply or to help support our Firewise and Barrett efforts. These are the programs that are going to help keep our community safe. And so that's the kind of work that I bring to the table is, is, is ensuring that, you know, we're able to get those dollars again back up to the Thank you. All right, Mark, you have two minutes. This is where business experience comes into play. I've been recruited by two different organizations, KCT and the Screen Actors Guild, to sit on their boards and to be able to get programs done. And these are completely opposite political ideologies of mine. When you sit down with four other board members, how do you get them to understand the needs of the district? How do you get them to agree to shift the taxes? You do that by doing the forensic audit, audit of the actual tax money that's going down there. You have to make an argument based on facts. $5.3 million of TOT money goes down to the valley. We don't get any of it back. Our firefighters are paid minimum wage. 
That's un unacceptable in my mind. So you have to argue from a position of what is right and what is just and what is the actual uh, um, revenues that are going down the valley. You can only do that by doing a forensic audit of the budget. That's it. I mean, that's coming from a businessman's perspective. It sounds dry, it sounds, how would you say, very heady, but that's the reality. You get those numbers, you understand how much is going down there, how much is coming back up here, and you start making your argument based on what this district needs. You talk about the fire, you talk about uh, fuel load reduction, you talk about firefighters being paid a good wage to work up here, you talk about getting more trucks, you talk about water distribution, you talk about all of the issues that our tax money should be funding up here. But until you understand how much is going down there, you don't have a platform to stand on. And in the last 16 years, or right in the last three years, our tax money has not returned to Eastern Madera County. Okay, Bobby, this next question starts with you. Um, I know a lot of the county dollars are already sort of spoken for, and uh, they're required to go in particular places. With regard to the discretionary spending of the county, how would you prioritize uh, spending discretionary dollars that flow through the county? So currently, 70% of our discretionary dollars go to public safety. That is the DA's office, that is the sheriff's office, county fire. We have agreements with Cal Fire, the state organization, to increase our fire stations. So we've actually got seven fire stations up here in Eastern Madera County. Um, and to fund our jails. And you know, we have a small portion of those funds that go to our roads. And so when I look at how we want to spend those discretionary dollars, I'm going to go back to how I started this whole conversation, which is we need to do a better job addressing issues of public safety. And so we take those discretionary dollars and we leverage them with state funding, as I referenced with our fire stations. We, we leverage them with federal dollars uh, in order to improve our roads. And so I'm not sure that we really need to switch up the use of our discretionary dollars. What we need to do is do a better job of leveraging those dollars so that way we can make best use of every single tax dollar uh, that is given to the county. All right, thank you. Uh, Mark, you have two minutes to respond. Discretionary funding based on the amount of tax revenue that's coming in. You want to increase the discretionary funding because the county's main priorities is fire and safety, which, which Bobby explained quite well. But the issue is we do not have a real business development program within Eastern Madera County. So we're stuck with a small amount of money. If we did the job that we should be doing, advocating for businesses to come into Eastern Madera County, we would raise the tax revenue up. We'd have more money for the DA's office. We'd have more money for the Sheriff's Department. We'd be able to pay our fire department and our firefighters more money. But if we keep looking at the one kitty and not figuring out how to build that kitty up, then we're failing as a county supervisor. So looking at the small amount, it's just like operating our own homes. I have a budget. I know how much I need to spend for my 11 grandkids, my three adult kids, my wife, myself, and my toys. If I want more toys, what do I do? I go out and get another job. I make more money. We need more money in this district. It's plain and simple. How do you do that? You have to have a strong business development program in place, and we don't have one now. Thank you. Both, you have two minutes to respond. I don't have a lot more uh, to add to what uh, both the gentlemen oh, decided. As I don't have a lot more to add to what the gentlemen, both gentlemen next to, next to me have uh, mentioned. Um, I would say that you know I'm you know Bobby's almost in a comment, so he's uh, access, he's privileged to uh, a lot of information that I don't have. Uh, so I, you know, it's, it's something I'm, but I, one thing I am keenly aware of: there is a problem. And to answer the question, all that I can see is that whatever discretionary dollars we have, we are not spending enough on the fire department. And if I have anything to say or do about it, I'm just going to focus 
on that primarily. Uh, if there's any changes, I mean, there, you know, it's it's, it's gone. I don't know, it's, it's gone in a particular direction, um, and and I'm not going to say unaddressed because that would be very unfair because there has been substantial progress. But we do need more funding for our fire departments. <laughs> that would be the beginning and the end of it for me in my first 100 days. Thank you. Thank you both. question before the break goes to you, Mark, um, and we've all already hit on it. I'm glad to know we're all on the same page. Uh, with regard to fire safety and insurance rates, what concrete steps can you take to help uh, solve those issues and make sure that insurance is available to all the residents of this district? The insurance companies aren't going to come into East, Eastern Madera County, Madera County until we actually get a hold of the three risk factors that the insurance companies look at. Like I said, topography we can't deal with. It's stuck. We're in the mountains. But fuel loads we can deal with. Tom McClintock has endorsed me for this campaign. <coughs> Had a great program up in Lake Tahoe. I've already talked to three of the contractors that did the, the fuel reduction, did the logging of the area, and the underbrush, and took it all out of it. That's what helped stop that fire from going through. We need the same kind of innovative ideas of bringing logging back up here to thin the forest down to take out the underbrush. We also need to ramp up what I was saying earlier, the spending on our fire department. We need to, to have higher pay for the paid call firefighters. We need higher pay for the individuals who are on staff 24 seven. We can't do that until we start having a solid business plan in this district because we're stuck with a small amount of money and that money is stretched thin. You hear the county constantly say every day, you call up about a pothole, you call up about a road, you call about anything. We don't have the money. Why don't they have the money? Because we are not advancing in business up here to increase the tax dollars. One of the biggest problems we have up here is housing. That does feed into the tax dollars. Every house that comes in that is built new gets onto the rolls of the property tax rolls, brings in more money to the county. We need to look at all the ways of building our own purse rather than figuring out how to shuffle the small amount of money that's in that purse. And until we get business-minded individuals in there, we're going to be stuck with the same thing. Go after grant money. Let's raise taxes. Let's do this. Let's do that. We never build the base of the, of the pot that we need to dive into. And that is the primary function that I'll be working on right there, is building up our housing, building up the businesses in the community, building up our tax base, building up the tax revenue that goes into Eastern Madera County, and then look exactly at what our budget is and demand in a very eloquent businessman's negotiation abilities that I have of bringing those funds back up to Eastern Madera County for our services. I think uh, the I think the approach that I would take um, if I were elected supervisor, I would uh, I would uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is I'd probably go to the state of California and I would make an appointment, go and sit down with uh, the uh, insurance commissioner. And I know all oh, it's you know we're all in Madera, you know, it's way over here, but you know, it starts with the dialogue. You know, we have a problem, a unique problem um, in this county. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, you've got insurance companies. Uh, my father was a broker uh, for about, I think, 30 years. Um, I wasn't involved in the insurance end of uh, the business, but um, I, I feel like, like a blank page. Uh, I'm open to all new ideas. And I actually sit down, you know, they wrote to, in the mortgage industry uh, when they wanted to write more loans and uh, make, you know, Houses more accessible, you know, to uh, younger people. They came up. It wasn't the greatest thing, but they came up with what was called the uh, uh, hybridized loans, um, and uh, everybody thought it was a pretty crazy idea. You know, I got a crazier one. Um, how about we? Uh, the uh, if you go and go purchase a house, and you put down hundred thousand dollars on that house, how about you get an insurance policy that covers that one hundred? 30 seconds, Bill. That covers that $100,000.
and you let the bank, because they're the big guys in, in, in the lending industry, you let the bank secure their own interest in those properties. Uh, the other thing, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but you know, it would be something like that, because uh, whatever's out now is not working now. And you can cut all the lawn, all the grass, you can do anything you want to do around your house. It's not going to make them lower what they can take from you, and they're going to take and take and take until somebody stops or somebody goes up with something different. It's time, Bo. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Bobby, you have two minutes. So the last question came up. Um, you know, with my background in insurance, I feel I have a pretty good understanding of, of what's going on there. And my platform on this topic has actually earned me the support of the Madera County Deputy Insurance Association, uh, Cal Fire Local 281, and most recently the uh, Madera Association of Realtors. They trust me uh, to lead us forward in this endeavor. And a couple of things I just want to mention is that you know a keen businessman needs to have a very good understanding of the business environment. And so just a, a couple of points of interest might be that you know, the feds actually outlawed the harvesting of old growth trees. So unfortunately, uh, Congressman McClintock's recipe there, I, I'm not sure that that's gonna work so well moving forward. Beyond that, the insurance commissioner has actually passed uh, regulations that change the old business model, the risk modeling for insurance companies. So they're no longer using zip codes to determine rates. They're actually providing uh, homeowners with what's called a risk score, which basically evaluates uh, homes and communities on an individual basis, providing more equitable and fair rates for consumers. And so what they're looking at is defensible spaces, uh, uh, fire resistant siding and roofing. These are the exact things that we're working on in our FireWise communities. And so the number of insurers that are recognizing the success of this program have doubled over the last month. That's the number of insurers that are offering discounts. Seconds, Bobby. That are offering discounts on your insurance premiums, okay? And beyond that, the murmurings coming out of the state is that those discounts are gonna be doubled as well. And so I'm confident that this FireWise program, the direction we're moving, is the right direction to go. But that doesn't mean we stop there. We need to continue taking bites out of this issue, because that's how you need to eat an elephant, right? Okay, thank you.
get to as many of your questions as possible. So let's sit down and let's get our candidates back up on the dais and let's get them some questions. So these are the kind of avenues that I'll be looking at to improve 
improve safety on Highway 41. It's expanding 41 through partnerships with the state and the feds. It's improving access onto roads. Um, anybody that's driven on 41 knows that you know there's half a dozen to a dozen different roads in which you know you're taking your life in your own hands when you're taking a left turn, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, we need to have safer roads, and so that will, of course, be a priority for me as your supervisor. Thank you, Bobby. Mark, you have uh, two minutes. Okay, before my time starts, uh, Sally, can you reread that? Because that's a very specific question, and I have a question in response back to it. Well, I'm not going to be able to get that for you, but how do you plan on addressing the safety of Highway 41 since Tesoro Viejo has gone in at least five dead? Well, the question I had about the five deaths, were they alcohol-related, drug-related, or were they just really specific accidents? At least four of them I know were alcohol-related. Okay. You can put all the signals up you want. You can put roundabouts. You can do whatever you want to do. And until we start dealing with the drug and alcohol problems within our community, we're going to continue having these major kind of wrecks. Sally, you know this. Unless we get the DA's office some real teeth, by in the individuals and have programs in a place for people who are caught for the first time of drinking and driving, we will have these accidents. Now, specifically to Tesero Viejo, that that uh, development should have it, 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 they should have paid for the widening of 41. They should have paid for overpasses coming in and out of it. They should have paid for the additional traffic that was being put on the Highway 41 and how to ingress and egress. It wasn't done. That was a failure on the planning department and the Board of Supervisors as a whole. But you're never going to stop an accident from happening. I was putting a sign up at 41, I gotta stop whistling, 41 and 145 at the uh, park and ride. And right as I was putting the sign up, I heard a big screech. It was a motorcycle slamming his brakes on and t bone a, a, a truck turning into the parking lot. You're going to have accidents, but how to address them is not major government control. It's addressing the issues that are creating the accidents. And as Sally said, four of the five deaths were alcohol related. We have to get serious about this in our communities. We have to get serious about it with our kids. We have to look at the actual core problem and address it from there. Thanks, Mark. Bobby, this next question comes to you, and then uh, Mark and Bo, you'll have two minutes to respond. So, Bobby, with the integrity of elections being questioned, what will you do to ensure secure elections in Madera County? Well, I want to start off and say that Tesoro Viejo is paying for the expansion of Highway 41. They're paying for it all the way up to 415. So the environment has been completed. That road will be expanded. I need you to move on to the current question. Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about election integrity, you know, I'm not running for elections, right? We, we have an elected official in that position, and she does a fantastic job. Over the last three years, we've caught a number of individuals uh, attempting to uh, skirt the system, commit voter fraud. So we've got two individuals who have uh, attempted to vote for one of their dead relatives, and we caught another individual who was um, guilty of um, uh, registering voters from outside the county. So I have a, a strong faith in our elections department, Becky Martinez. I think they do a good job. Um, and you know, if time comes, at some point in time, I need to run for elections. Um, we'll see, but right now my focus is on the duties of the supervisor um, and ensuring that I can address, you know, the purview of that position, not elections. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, you have two minutes. I just spoke to Rebecca Martinez. She has her whole heart into her job in ensuring a, a safe, fair, and a, um, an honest election. However, I'm one of the few defendants on a lawsuit in the state of California that is suing the state of California for the last 10 years of legislation that has been passed that creates the fertile grounds for election manipulation. Can't say fraud because fraud is a legal term, but we are looking at how do we get back to the hallmark of this nation, and that is integrity within our elections. If the general public doesn't feel that the election was fair, and correct that we're failing in our jobs as a whole. And in addressing this, just like Bobby said, I'm not running for 
the elections position, I'm running for county supervisor. The county supervisor does have a little say so in looking at it. And until this nation gets back to fair and equitable elections, one election day, you have to mail in ballots that are that are justified, meaning you're in a rest home, you're out of the country, you're military. There's no reason to show up, there's no reason not to show up in the ballot box and cash your vote. If we can get back to that, our elections will be held and it, they will be looked upon as fail proof at that point. But this mass mail out ballot, <coughs> ballots of the state of California, I've known several houses that have had four or five ballots that have been delivered to them for people who don't even live there anymore. That's right for fraud. If you can't catch them, and this is not just addressing Monero County, this is addressing the entire state of California. And I've looked at several counties throughout the state, and, and the manipulation of elections is there. It is based on legislation that's been passed in the last 10 years. And that's what I've been fighting for for about 10 years myself. Bo, you have two minutes. Okay, I don't have a lot to say about, you know, uh, voter, I guess voter fraud, or, or uh, voter integrity. Uh, I just know that, you know, there's an election that's coming up. It's one man, one vote. Uh, once the votes are cast, hey, uh, if I won, I'm going to accept that. If I lost, I'm going to accept that as well. Um, I have 100% confidence in the lady that runs the elections in this county. And I also lived in Fresno County briefly. I knew a lady by the name of, she was the uh, uh, registrar in uh, Fresno County. And I was really, really, really impressed with her as well. Um, I've known Rebecca uh, Martinez. I've voted for her over and over again. Um, so I got confidence there. But when I was in Fresno, Brandy Orr uh, was the registrar. What I was impressed about her was I was concerned. I said, you know, I'm voting, and I'm voting last minute, like I always did, you know. I literally walked up to the elections office. I had my ballot in hand. This lady walked up to me, shook my hand, introduced herself as a registrar. What was more important than that, or more impressive than that, the very next year, so it was two years, same place, same time, that lady walked up to me again and she asked me, was I satisfied? Well, she personally asked me, was I satisfied with the results? I never thought I'd run for office. And like I said, I, uh, I, I believe in the system. You know, I'm just not one of those guys that, you know, it's going to go out and go question too much. I'm not going to accuse anybody of, of doing anything fraudulent or illegal. Um, I think we have a great country. I think we have a great system. And uh, like I said, I'll say it again, uh, we have a good registrar, and uh, I think it'll be a great result. However it turns out, I had a fair shot, and that's all I asked for. Thank you, Bo. <laughs> this next question starts with you, Mark. Uh, do you have any plans to uh, facilitate incorporating Oakhurst as a city? Why or why not? No, I don't. That's not a VOS initiative, that is a citizen's initiative. That's really all I got to say about that. It's something we don't engage in. Uh, it's something that the citizens of, of Oakhurst or East of Madera County, if they want to do it, they're going to petition it, they're going to put it together. I think it was in 2007. Uh, I think it was in 2007 they attempted to do it. Um, it failed because uh, multiple reasons why it failed. Uh, people don't want the city, the Oakhurst area, to be incorporated. Um, there is an initiative on the on the docket now, and that is the community service district. The community service district has the 19 services that a city does offer and or supply. Right now, it was passed, the resolution was passed on September 14th, 2021. It's gonna go in front of LAFCO for a feasibility study, which is gonna cost the taxpayers of Madera County $400,000. If it is feasible, they will send it to the voters for a two-thirds vote of the area that is affected by it. However, the way CSDs are funded by state mandate, it's a 1% fee or assessment onto your property taxes. The 
five-member board that is elected by the citizens of the community service district will put it forward to the community. Do you want this service or not? The hammer that's over the head of the community service district is it's illegal for the county to supplement a community service district with your tax money. So more of our tax money will stay down in the valley. It's been floated out there that a tax sharing agreement will come into place. Well, the only tax sharing agreement we've seen by four other county supervisors, we're keeping all of your money and you can have nothing. So I don't think a tax sharing agreement is going to benefit us any which way at all. We need a strong supervisor that's going to stand up against the other four supervisors, negotiate and bring our resources back to Eastern Madera County, bring the tax revenue level up by having a strong business development program and housing program for Eastern Madera County. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Bo, you have two minutes. Okay, I don't have uh, too much uh, to add to that or uh, contrary to that. Uh, I don't, you know, I live in the Seminole Lakes Park, and that's just on the road from here. Uh, we moved here 40 years ago, and here we're talking about, you know, breaking off and becoming, uh, I don't know, a community service district at that time. It went nowhere. And uh, I think I was up here when they were talking about putting an airport up in Oakhurst. And, um, and Oakhurst, you know, one of the, I guess it was 2007. Um, and that went nowhere as well. Um, sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for. Um, everybody wants to, you, you don't want to be taxed, but um, I think you're going to get more taxation than you're, you're really anticipating because none of this stuff will be done for free. You know, you got to get a fire department, you got to get a uh, police department. Lawyers, uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff, and I don't think that people um, really anticipate uh, what it is that they're actually asking for. So, no, I would not support uh, the uh, uh, community service district. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Bobby, two minutes. Um, I'm not sure where to start here, but um, I, I'm a little confused because I think at our last debate, I'm not our last debate, the debate with the uh, Ogres Democrats, one of the candidates um, let us know that he wanted to incorporate the entire mountain communities of um, Eastern New York County. So, confused by that first response, but a couple points of correction here is, is one, the proposed CSD does not require a 1% uh, property tax. Two, um, it's not a $400,000 uh, study, it's a $46,000 study. And of the 19 services that could be provided by a community service district, 17 of those would be considered latent services, as in they're not active services. The two services that would be included in said, uh, the proposed community service district would be uh, fuel reduction, as well as parks and recreation. Now these are two services in Eastern Madera County that are lacking. You know, I had a conversation with the board members here at the uh, community center before we started. And if you work in any nonprofits in this community, you know that we need help. We need support. And that's what that's about. And so when we talk about fuel reduction, you know, we've all talked about fire, we've all talked about insurance. And I think the number one thing that we can do here in Eastern Madera County to address fire, to address the insurance rates, is do a better job of managing our public and private lands. And so personally, I will not support incorporation. I know my dad was uh, instrumental in bringing that initiative forward. But I, I think when we talk about the need for additional services, you know, those services are, um, you know, widespread throughout the mountain area. And so we need to work together just like we do when fire comes. We need to come together as a community and support each other. And if we can do that for a 2% TOT tax, I think it's something worth looking at. Sally, please. All right, thank you. Sally, okay. I'm really privileged since he mentioned comments that I made in another. You can address those in your closing. In my closing. Don't worry about it. Okay, next question. And this question goes to you both. There's a unmanned fire station in Yosemite Lakes Park. It does not have sleeping quarters in it. Will there be anything done to support this, man this, anytime soon? 
I'd say that uh, that fire station from Mary Wood, uh, I watched it grow. Uh, it does a, an amazing job. Um, I think there's a, like 2,500 lots in there. I don't know what the population is. Um, but it's definitely going to have to be addressed. And I think a combination of uh, the Homeowners Association, some of their uh, funding, uh, along with uh, some of the tax dollars, uh, could possibly be allocated uh, to that particular fire station so that uh, it is bad. Um, the right to be housing units uh, built on it. I think they have an acre of land, and it's right next to, uh, yeah, there's a vacant lot, I believe, right next to it. So there's definitely room to expand. And uh, yes, that would be something that I would address along with the other unmanned stations. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bobby, you have two minutes. So we've talked a little bit about business development, bringing more taxes in so we can fund facility improvements and improved services in the area. And I'll let you know, the county does have an economic development incentive package that's passed in 2019. It was put forth to help uh, spur uh, business development in the area. But when we look at facility improvements, they have to be done in partnership. Um, we're seeing it right now out in North Fork with improvements being made at the North Fork Fire Station. And when we talk about improving specifically the fire station in YLP, I'd like to see a partnership between the county, uh, the community of YLP, and the federal government. So we have a great program, it's called um, Safer, it's a safer program. It's the same way we expanded and built a facility over at Oakhurst, the, the fire station over there. And so we've done it once, we'll do it again, and we'll do it again in Bass Lake. And when time comes for the community to work on funding full-time firefighters, those facilities will be available for use. Thanks, Bobby. Mark, you have two minutes. If you listen to the, the response, he said that the 2% added TOT tax is going to pay. The TOT tax has to, by state law, go to the general fund. The general fund then is a tax sharing agreement. It's not going to come back up here. Unless you start getting serious about funding fire stations. Like he says, he brings up the one in Northport, the Chichansi uh, Indian tribe brought in money to build it. They can't even get permits because the building department is so backed up they can't they can't get the permits to build it. It's still going to be an unmanned fire station. They're going to have Sierra uh, ambulance service. It's going to have there and the sheriff's substation there, but still no firefighters there. You can't get the firefighters if you're going to pay them $15 an hour and pay the assistance to the, to the supervisors $45 an hour. It just doesn't work. So you can talk all the sharing agreements and everything else and until you start looking at it with a real business plan of how to generate more business. Since 2019, we've lost businesses. So I don't know what the business plan is that my opponent is talking about, but if it's a business plan that works, why are we losing businesses in Eastern Madera County? We're not increasing businesses. We're losing businesses. So we can talk real or we can talk fantasy. What has been the performance in the last six years? No manned fire stations. No paid firefighters lining up at the door to get $15 an hour. We don't have manned stations up here. The six stations that are unmanned, five of them are in Eastern Madera County. We need somebody with a business plan that will pull it off and not just talk about it. We've had enough talk for 16 years and the stations have closed in that administration. They haven't opened. They've been closed during this administration. This is what my opponent Okay, is fine. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. The next question goes to Bobby. So, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Bobby. Young people feel like they're being priced out of the housing market, either buying or renting. What can and will you do to fix this? Well, let's start off and I'm not sure if there's anybody from the North Fork Rancheria that don't know any needs here, but I hope they weren't watching. Um, when it comes to housing, you know, we need to think creatively about bringing housing in. And so, you know, when we develop partnerships with the state, we can bring in state funding so that way we can build more housing, uh, workforce housing that's available for residents in the area. 
So I have a project that's going to bring 120 units to the Oakhurst area. It goes before the Planning Commission in June. I'm excited to see that happen. But it doesn't stop there. We need to work with our private developers as well. So happy to say that over the last three weeks, I've developed some relationships that will culminate in additional workforce housing. You know, I'm a big fan of the private industry, right? Um, when there's a niche that needs to be filled, private enterprise comes in and they fill that niche. And so developers are understanding that there's a void in communities like Eastern Madera County, and that void is workforce housing. So these folks want to come in, they want to invest in our community, and as your supervisor, I will work with these folks to ensure that you know, they don't have a tough time with the planning department, that they can get through, they can get their building uh, permits, uh, that the uh, fees are reasonable, so that way the cost of these um, uh, the, uh, of the buildings, you know, is is fair and reasonable for folks that need that housing. So thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Mark, you have two minutes to respond. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, they have been priced out of buying homes. They have been priced out of renting homes. That's just a simple fact because we've had a no development attitude in eastern Madera County for quite some time. The building department has failed in getting permits through. Talk to any contractor in eastern Madera County and they'll tell you the same thing. You talk to anybody who has sold their house in another area and they bring the equity up here and they want to build a house. It takes them over a year to get a building permit. I'm not going to wait that long if I was one of those individuals and I got the equity. That's just building homes. Now, you talk about affordable homes. I say challenge any of these two to put a number on that. What's an affordable home? Based on a good wage earner, a single wage earner home, it's about $250,000. Two wage earners can make it without a problem. You partner up with a contractor, you, you create the program, first of all, you create the program of putting properties in that can be slots split quick in appropriate areas. Then you can get a contractor to build kit houses. You have another local contractor who will put the kit house together on the property. This is a very standard planned house, a rectangular home with three bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, living room, two car attached garage, no granite countertops, no terracotta floors, just a simple starter home. You can bring in HUD money, you can put qualifications on it, meaning they can't rent or sell the house for five years. The other aspect of it is we need to address, like I said earlier, the Airbnb, vacation rentals, and bed and breakfast. And I do have a, and I have talked about quite in-depthly, a plan to equitably address that so we can protect the integrity of our bedroom communities and retirement, <coughs> excuse me, retirement communities. Mm -hmm. Bo, you have two minutes. I guess you did earlier, I am a, a licensed general contractor, and uh, it's been probably about eight, eight to nine years since I've done a project, you know, other things have, you know, the cost of materials have gone up, and the cost of construction's up, and, you know, and quite naturally, yes, the building department fees are up. Um, what I propose to do to help uh, jumpstart the economy and possibly bring in some uh, first-time buyers or uh, some younger people is to uh, defer the building uh, fees. When I say defer, I'm not saying that giving, giving them away or not collecting them. I'm just saying that um, I know that uh, the last project I did, $28,000 is what I paid for mitts and fees before I even came up out of the ground. It's a lot of money, and uh, it, it, it does put a damper on your, I don't care what it is you're building, you know, it, it, it causes you pause. Do you want to do that the next time? Um, so what I, I propose is that uh, those fees actually get uh, deferred until the project is actually built, sold, or uh, refinanced. Okay, and that, that's one thing. The other thing is the private developer that uh, they talk about, I may be one of them. And, uh, you know, my thing, I'm hands-on. Um, I intend to bring money. It's, it's, it's inheritance money. I intend to bring it into the area that I live in, and I intend to build some low-income housing with my own money. Put your money where your mouth is. And when I do it, it'll be all cash projects, and I can set the rental fee 
at anything I decide I want to set it at. Um, that would be my personal investment uh, to a problem. My wife and I were young and we came here, we were 24 years old, we came here because we came from uh, Santa Clara Valley, uh, Silicon Valley. Okay, that's, that's time going, thank you. Next question goes to uh, Mark. Mark, what is your understanding of the role of Madera County Animal Services in eastern Madera County? And can you identify an area that needs to be addressed and how you would address it? I've been on the ranch for quite some time. I have a company that does educational programs for schools, teaching kids about animals, how to take care of them, what they're all about, all ranch animals. Animal control is, is very simple. It's a reactive uh, agency. If they get a call or a complaint of a stray animal, uh, they get a call or a complaint of an animal that's kind of mean and vicious and the next door, they come out and they address it. They're not just wandering around looking to, to address a problem. They're reactionary to problems that exist within the community. Somebody is starving a horse and somebody is starving a cow, they go out there and they take care of it. That is the proper role, is humane treatment of animals. Uh, this is what I've been doing for 20 years. One of my companies is dealing with animals and the proper behavior and, and treatment of them in housing. Uh, one of the few licensed uh, exotic animal uh, carriers in the state of California. There's only 480 of us that have permits to house primates. And I've dealt with primates, trained primates in large caps for about 25 years. And so I'm very, very familiar with a large swath of animals and how to take care of them, dealing with the USDA, Fish and Game, and local departments as well. As long as you work with them, they work with you, and they will do bend over backwards because they're individuals who really care about animals. And is pertaining to a, a, any area where there's an abused animal, put it in the top area to me. Uh, people will always ask me on my, my ranch, what is my favorite animal? My response is always a happy, healthy animal. And that's it. So I don't know of any major targeted areas. So. Well, there, wait a minute, there is actually one that just comes to mind over here on, on uh, right, right up the road here, there's a, a homeless encampment, and they've got about 40 dogs there. You know the one, Sally, I'm trying to think of it. It's, it's um, I can try to remember the street name of it right now. Uh, it's right up here, about a mile and a half up. And those are issues that need to be dealt with, and severely dealt with. Uh, two of the people that are on that property have already been uh, convicted of animal abuse. And when you're convicted of animal abuse, you're not allowed to own animals again. And so, it's, it's beyond my concept why there's another 20 to 40 dogs on that property again. So these are the things where working with the DA, working with the animal uh, rec department is going out to these individuals and hold them accountable for the abuse of animals. Thank you very much. Mark, both of you have about two minutes to respond. Animal control, uh, they, uh, play, they play a, a really, really big part uh, of this county. Um, I, one of the things that uh, I know we have an issue with is uh, stray cats. And I think we have about four or five of them, and they love to have kittens. They multiply really quick. The mm -hmm. uh, problem we've had is, um, is there a program in place that actually spays these cats? They don't multiply the numbers that they do. Um, animal control, and, you know, I, I called, I know, the, I know one of the ladies personally, and, you know, she said that they don't have, uh, they, they no longer take kittens and cats in um, to spay them. Um, and, I, and I think it's a, it's a shame because it creates a hardship, a problem, because uh, they're, they're just everywhere. Um, but uh, they do have a very integral part uh, to play. Um, we have a cattle ranch. And uh, one of the ladies that uh, I do know personally, uh, I call her out all the time, hey, you know, I, I get advice from her. Um, you know, what should we do? We have uh, veterinarians uh, to come out and take care of, you know, my animals for me. Um, you know, I, I'm really appreciative. I don't really have anything negative to say uh, about uh, the job that they do. But, uh, and I appreciate everything that's been done. Thanks, Bo. Bobby? 
So, um, animal services is one of the toughest departments at the county, you know, and, and really they're able to accomplish what they do in partnership, you know, with the Friends of Madera Animal Shelter and Eastern Madera County SPCA. And so I would go back to, you know, how we started this conversation, which was, you know, the county works better when we work in partnership with the community. And working in partnerships with these nonprofits as well as educational institutions that teach individuals, teach our youth what it means to take care of your pet and what are the consequences of not properly taking care of your pet. So it's not a overly complex issue, but it's an issue that takes work and it, it takes attention. So I'm proud of the work that the Derrick County Animal Services does. They're, they're very responsive. Um, they follow up on issues of barking dogs, um, pigs, pig farms. Um, you know, we are a right to farm county, but you know, th that, that ordinance does have its limitations. And so it's important that people are educated about the issues. They're educated about um, proper care for their pets. And so again, working with our local area nonprofits, um, we're working with educational institutions to ensure that folks have the, the knowledge, the understanding that you know you can get a stay and neuter uh, car from Friends of an Area Animal Shelter or from SPCA. There's resources available out there if you've got a feral cat population that needs to be addressed. And so getting that information out to the public is always going to be a priority. Thank you, Bobby. This next question goes to you both. But what steps would you take to uh, improve or create staff efficiency in your staff if you're a supervisor? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, realize what you don't know and uh, going out and identifying people that do know and uh, finding experts uh, in particular fields that uh, I might be shoring up um, in. I've got my eye on several people that um, I think that I think uh, would be uh, instrumental in helping me uh, get going and uh, guide the county uh, to the next four years. Uh, it's one of those things where you know I think we ran a, a pretty good nonpartisan race. Um, I'd be willing to uh, reach across and uh, form coalitions and. Uh, form uh, partnerships with uh, people from, you know, that, that may not necessarily agree with uh, whatever it is that I agree with, that I you know, subscribe to, but um, I'm open to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, Bobby, that goes next to you. So, uh, a good friend of mine says that there are no bad employees. There's only bad supervisors the job of the supervisor to get rid of the bad employees. So good leadership starts at the top. And we have to understand that we're only as good as the people that work underneath us. And so while I'm not an expert in human resources, I am just three classes short of getting my master's degree in human resources. So I do have some understanding of you know, good practices that help stimulate a positive working environment. And really what we're talking about there is ensuring that we have competitive wages, not just with surrounding counties, but with industry wages. Ensuring that we get the best staff and we're able to retain that staff. Because the most expensive part of employees is training new employees. And so we have to stop the turnover at Madera County. We have to ensure that people come here and we can attract good talent. Beyond that, it's about fair evaluations, having a, a clear understanding with employees of their expectations, um, their paths to success, ensuring that they have avenues for growth. So that way when you start as you know a technician in public health, you have that opportunity, that understanding of what it's going to take to get to the next level or perhaps transfer it to another department where you can you know improve your skills and uh, uh, prolong your career working at the county. Because again, you know, we're only as good as the people that work underneath us. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Mark? 
Now the question was, is, is what I would do with my staff? The county supervisor doesn't have any staff. The county supervisor is an elected official. Dave Arney of the HR department of the county of Madera is the one who controls the hiring and firing of employees. It's up to the county supervisor to create an atmosphere of growth within the county to be able to afford, as Bobby has, has eloquently pointed out, be able to pay them a good wage. We don't have enough money in the coffers to pay our firefighters a good wage. We don't have enough money in our coffers to pay the staff good wages. So they will come here, get trained, go to another county. They can grow. I had a company, I had 34 employees and seven trucks that went out. That was one company. The second company I had, I had 15 employees and three trucks going out. I know what it is to employ somebody. I know what it is to create the incentives. I've done it. I've been there. But the county supervisor does not have staff. Even the assistant of the county supervisor is an employee of the county. So it's up to Dave Barney, it's up to the HR department to hold our county uh, employees accountable for job performance. What are they doing? And that is a unified effort within the county administrative offices headed up by Jay Barney. As a county supervisor, I would build the county's coffers to be able to hire the appropriate staff to be able to pay the appropriate staff and have the benefits that any employee looks for going to a company, going to a county. This is by my family, a lot of them are firefighters and Leos in several counties because the benefits are good, the pay is good. If we're losing employees in the county of Madera it's because we are not treating them well, then that's it. All right, thank you. This next question box goes to you. If the Madera County Office of Education voted to teach critical race theory in Madera County schools, would you oppose or support that? Thanks for that question, John, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's, it's really not something that I would ever see coming up at the county, uh, but frankly, if you know, we need to teach critical race theory at the county level, to address issues of discrimination, there's a lot more going on there. There's a lot bigger problems going on at the county than that. And so if that item came before me as a supervisor, I would ask our human resources department, what the heck is going on? You know, because we got to think harder. It's not about critical race theory. We're here to do a job, you know, and if we're discriminating against folks here in the county, those people got to go. There's no place for that. Thank you, uh, Mark. Critical race theory is not a class. Critical race theory is a thought and ideology that has infiltrated every subject matter in our schools and it has absolutely no place in our schools. You've asked the question. <laughs> you asked the question how I feel about it. That's exactly how I feel about it. Along with, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, gender identity, sex education. You know, I've laughed and I've joked about sex education. My great-grandparents didn't have sex education, and you know what, they figured it out. The proof of it is, I'm here. <laughs> they have no business teaching certain subjects in our schools, period. <laughs> we need to make our feelings known. We need to make them clear, succinct, it's not about discrimination. I'm a carpet-carrying American Indian. I've been called a carpetbagger. Calling an American Indian a carpetbagger? Give me a break. I was here before everybody else showed up. So look at what the attitude that critical race theory creates. It is racism. It creates racism. It is racism. We are one race, it's called the human race, yeah. period. There's no if, ands, or buts about that. And God made man and woman. Politicians made everything else. Sex education, uh, 
I, uh, every opportunity I got, um, I tried to out my child out of it simply because what I wanted my children to understand and what I wanted them to believe in, I wanted it to come from my heart, my wife's heart, and our home. That was what was important to me. Uh, it's not up to me to force any ide ideology uh, on you as far as, you know, all I can say is, you know, you guys brought up, or, you know, Mark brought up, you know, sexualization of, you can say it that word, in that, that way, but um, young children, I mean, it's, it's school's not the place for it. They're being children, and, uh, you know, whether well, they're girls, boys, but they're going to figure all that out. I figured it out. My wife and I figured it out. We've been together since we're 14 and 15 years old. we got eight kids. That's all i got to say about it. Hey, Mark, this next question comes to you. Uh, road maintenance issues are ongoing here in Madera County. What's your plan to improve this? One of the big problems of road maintenance is the state has mandated that only 10% of the roads can be fixed in-house. The rest of it has to be prevailing wage. And so the county constantly tells us we don't have money. We don't have money. I, I, we hear that all the time. We have a lot of uh, uh, maintenance districts with roads as well. We need to address those. But primarily, it's having the advocate and connections where I have six Congress people that is supporting me. Tom McClintock has fully endorsed me for this job. Uh, Mike Garcia has fully endorsed me for this job. I can walk into their offices and start talking to them about advocating for the, the federal DOT grant money that comes back to us from our gas tax. I brought this up in past uh, candidate forums. In 2018, both the Republican and the Democrat caucuses in the state of California failed to advocate for DOT federal DOT tax money. They brought back one project, $18 million, in Long Beach. We need to hold our elected officials from the county level up to the federal level accountable and pressure them, work with them, bring back our tax money. As Bobby has talked about coupling federal money with the state money, because we give a lot of money to the state, we give a lot of money to the feds, through our gas tax. We are one of the biggest states that have the most, most expenses on fuel. So why haven't we had the leadership within this county to go after that money and bring it back? Why haven't we put the programs together? It's because they don't have these relationships. This is what you get when you have a business person that has the relationships of 48 years. And I have that, that's what I'm bringing to the table. These are the things that I'm going to address, not just on a happy dream, but real cutthroat business attitude of walking in and saying, Tom, here's the projects that Matt Trouble has put on the wall. Let's bring it in. We don't need to keep taxing us like measure T. We can tax, tax, tax. Until we get the tax, we've already put into the kitty back to this district. We're going to have road problems and road maintenance problems. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Both, you have two minutes. Um, real, short, real short and simple, um, I'm not a proponent of uh, the Williamson's Act. Uh, we are a large landowner, owners of our family. I, I, it's one of those things that I uh, kind of struggle with, kind of ride the fence on. Um, I'm pro development. You know, part of the problem is people complain about the roads, they complain about you know, not having enough money. Um, part of that is, you know, uh, you won't let the, you know, parts of this county develop. And uh, that, that means, you know, subdividing some parcels of land or uh, building upon the parcels that are, you know, uh, that are already subdivided. And uh, nobody's doing anything with them. Uh, we got to create a tax base. You can go for miles and miles and miles, you know. I'm a cattle rancher, I've said it. Um, all you're going to see is barbed wire and empty fields. And maybe we need to, you know, maybe address that. That's it. Thank you. Bobby? So I think it's important to understand that when we maintain our roads, the cost to maintain them goes down, right? And so when we have roads that are all chewed up, and the only answer is we can either fill, fill the potholes 
where we go in and we strip the road, that's an expensive endeavor. But when we maintain them at a certain threshold, the cost of maintenance is reduced because you just have to do an overlay, a surface overlay. So improving the quality of our roads one by one is the priority. It's maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. And so when I look at the, what the county's done over the last decade, um, there's a lot of things I would do differently. One, right now we're doing a bridge replacement program project out on Road 200, which is great. We're straightening the Crippen Bridge. I'm excited for that, but I'm disappointed that that project is being funded 100% by Measure T. That's not what those dollars were for. They're there to be leveraged, so that way we can do more projects. Those dollars should have gone towards maintenance, because when we maintain our roads, the cost of maintenance goes down. It's quite simple. So that's what I'll do. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, folks, this next question comes to you. Um, it, it, it came to us as a question about yards. I'm going to spread it out and say uh, yards. yards, the bus. Oh, so, yards. yeah, I'm going to ask you, uh, what can you do to improve uh, public transportation in District 5? Let's stop. In District 5, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I live in uh, Raymond, and uh, one of my platform uh, promises was that um, if I was elected, uh, I wanted to establish, actually link up Raymond, Hawani, go on through Oakhurst, and back down past Trip Johnson, and come on back, and either go across uh, four, uh, Yosemite Links Drive, and uh, come on back and do a loop. Um, I think it, it's doable, um, and I think we have the resources to do it. Um, I think it's just somebody sitting down the schedule and making it happen. Um, I did get some blowback from uh, people in Raven uh, stating that maybe they didn't want to um, link up you know, with uh, someone. And I, and I think it's kind of detrimental to that area and some of the other areas because um, from Raymond, you know, there are a lot of young people that could get jobs up here. There are jobs up here, uh, well, in Oakhurst, you know, they could get there. There's a couple of new hotels. Um, that would be uh, transportation, uh, you know, through and around. I know that when I worked for Home Depot, and my wife and I, it was eight children, and uh, we had one car. And so her job was to get everybody to school and get me off uh, to, I hate to say it, to go to the edge of Yosemite Lakes Park. And I used to have to hitchhike down because we didn't have transportation. I used to have to hitchhike down 41, uh, where I'd get a ride, I'd go to Valley Children's, and what did I do? I bought a bus, and the bus took me over to Clovis, where I ran the lumber department. This went on for about three years. I never missed a day of work. Um, it was always on time. You know, didn't get fired. But I think it's definitely, it would definitely be an improvement uh, to just make sure that we had a complete route and, you know, I'd say, you know, every, if it couldn't be every 15 minutes, um, the frequency could be every half hour. But it definitely is something that we need and I would support. It. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Bobby. So the best thing we can do to improve public transportation in the area is, is kind, of a, kind of a weird answer here, but it's to improve our cell towers. You know, if you live here in the area, you know that you lose cell service driving from Oakhurst to Bass Lake, but you can't drive to Raven with adequate cell service. So when we improve our cell service, we can actually bring in private industry like, um, is it Lyft or Uber, right? And so I would like to see the county work in partnership with organizations like Lyft and Uber, Uber to subsidize what we're already doing. We have the Madaria County uh, regional transportation system. We have the senior bus that travels around. These are all money losers. They're not designed to make money. They're designed to provide a service. And we need to ensure that that service is provided uh, efficiently, effectively, and cost, you know, minimize the cost of those services. And we can do that through partnerships with private industry. Thanks, Bobby. Mark? As a father of three and a grandfather of 11, let me tell you, I understand public transportation real well, I'm in. 
Is it the proper role of government to supply public transportation? No. It is a benefit to offer senior citizens. It's a benefit to offer people with ADA, you know, disabilities, to give them these access for mobility and accessibility to in-town services, at the supermarket, in banking, and so forth. But is it the government's responsibility to supply public transportation for the general public? No. As Bobby said, there isn't a public transportation system out there in the state of California that makes money. They are money suckers of the coffers. Does the county of Madera have the money to do that? No, they don't have the money to pay our firefighters. They don't have the money to fix our roads. They don't have the money for anything. So can we improve public transportation? Yes, we can improve it by having a real business plan up here that's going to pay more than $15 an hour to help with the issues that our federal government has created by creating gas up to $6, $7 a gallon. You can't afford a car. Paying for the gas, paying for the insurance, paying for the maintenance, and working a $15 an hour job. So we need real business development up here so people can buy a car, a economical car, and be able to go back and forth to work. But the services supplied by the county for disabilities, for senior citizens, to me, that's not a money loss. That is a service that's provided by the, by the generosity of the taxpayer for individuals who can't do it. And that's something that I would push for more of because we're lacking it, seriously lacking it. My wife and my daughter do in-home care service for seniors. They drive them around because they can't get driven. That's not part of their job, but okay. they do it. Thank anyway. you, Mark. We've come to that time in the evening when uh, the candidates are going to be able to make their closing statements. So each candidate will have five minutes, and this is an opportunity to address anything they feel was unaddressed and give you their parting words uh, before you all head off to the ballot box. As, as it happens, we've been just kind of rolling around in a circle. You may have been able to figure out my system, or maybe not. Uh, but the first person who's going to give us their five-minute summation is going to be Bob. Thanks again, Sally. Um, so it's funny how life works, right? And we plan, and we plan, and we plan, and we plan, and then our plans go out the window, we get a curveball. And so, about 10 years ago, I got a curveball from my mom, actually. She called me, and she said, we need you. We need you to move home, and we need your help at the family business. So I quit my job, packed up, and I moved home, because that's what you do. And so even then, you know, I couldn't have imagined standing here before all of you, asking you for your support for my candidacy for District 5 Supervisor. It's a humbling thing. But here I am. But I'm not here because I want to collect a paycheck. I'm not here because I want to advance my political career. I'm here because if you go outside and you look at that hillside, you're going to see a disaster waiting to happen. I'm here because the people I grew up with, my friends, the people that helped raise me, can no longer afford to live here. I'm here because the state of California keeps passing more and more regulations that is making it virtually impossible to live in rural California. That's why I'm here. And so, I want to emphasize that no one else here today has more experience working in this community, navigating the bureaucracy of our county, of the state, of the federal government than I do. Fire insurance, public safety, wildfire, affordable housing, I will turn the dial on these issues, I promise you that. But it goes beyond that for me because residents aren't just getting a supervisor. You need more than a supervisor. You need a community advocate, someone that's willing to work themselves to the bone, someone that loves this community and is willing to go above and beyond what's happening, right? Because it's not about politics. It's about community. And so when I think about community, when I think about politics, I think about the 2016 election. 
Voters are tired of politicians. They're tired of lip service. They're tired of promises that can't be kept. They demand representatives that are there for their interest. They don't care what we know. They want to know that we care. Care about what's going on in their lives. Care about their well-being and their interest. And that's why I'm here. Is because I want to bring trust back to local government. But how do you trust someone you don't know? How do you trust someone you just met? For me, it's about results. It's about a track record of success. I haven't been here for the past decade. I've been a leader in this community for the past decade, working to ensure that the needs of residents in the area are met. I've been working my tail off to make sure that our youth, our seniors, those in need have someone to turn to. And so when you're filling out your ballot on June 7th, I hope that you'll trust in community. I hope you'll trust in results. I hope you'll trust in me. And so thank you all very much. I appreciate you all being here. I'll be here after the event. If anybody wants to ask me some questions or have some good conversations, I invite you to do so. Thanks again. Thanks, Bobby. my esteemed opponent said out there there's a that, that disaster waiting to happen. Who's been running this county, at least in Madera County for the last 16 years? Who created it? I have a track record in federal and state and county politics as a national rep for American Indians, as a business owner dealing with them back and forth for longer than my opponent has been alive. Do I need to state that I have all of my experiences from this county? No, I don't need to state that. My opponent's education came from outside of this county. His education and the issues that are facing us in this county came from by, by his employer, the current supervisor. It's a disaster waiting to happen. No, it's a disaster in place. Our children are priced out of homes. My 11 grandkids, 10 of them are granddaughters. I don't want them moving from the area to buy a home. I want them to buy a home here. It's about experience. Yes, it's about care. It's about concern. It's about heartfelt response to the community's needs. Not from a person who has created the problems, but from a person who understands the problems, has the bevy of individuals to bring in to solve the problems. Because together, we will solve the problems. Together on the federal level, on the state level, bringing the proper resources here, we can solve the problems that have been created over the last 16 years. Problems that have been ignored. Problems we see each and every day. It's not about just caring. It's about action. It's about employment. It's about housing. It's about insurance. How do you understand these things if you've never owned a home? How do you understand these things truly if you've never run a business? How do you truly understand what your children go through if you don't have children? If you haven't made these hard decisions for your children, if you haven't sat up worrying about your children's future, if you haven't sat there and worried about your wife, with our roads of homelessness walking around that are dangerous, of the stabbings that take place. This has been going on and has been created over the last 16 years of a mentality of no accountability. And that goes from the county level all the way down to the street level. You may not know me. That's because most people know my wife. Because I'm busy working. I have homes in four counties. I have businesses in three counties. All of this is being brought down to a stop. I had a company that shared in Texas buying and selling ex-military equipment. That's shut down already. I'm in the shutdown mode of retirement. My retirement is giving back to a community that has in part given me a lot of my success. It's giving me a place to live 
and retire and be buried in. This community is a growing community and needs the expertise to guide that growth. So all of our children in this generation, the next generation, and the next generation have a county that they can call home. Our cattlemen, our ag, our dairy farmers can continue on with a lifestyle that they love so dearly that has been passed down from generation to generation. We can work in unison with one another of the massive diversity that exists in Madera County. It's up to you on this election day. And I'm very humbly asking for your vote. I'm very humbly asking for your trust. And I'm humbly asking for your guidance once elected into office. As an open door policy, I will never shut anybody up, even if you can't stand me. It's one of my campaign slogans. That's my cell phone number on my tripod. I promise I won't change it. You can call me up anytime to ask a question or if you want to, to just tell me off. Because I will be here. Thank you very much.
As a matter of fact, when I said I wanted to run God's with you, I would have done it for free. I didn't even know there was a salary involved in it. Okay? Uh, I'm committed. You know, I'm up for the task. I got broad shoulders. I can take it. I'm here. Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate uh, the support that I do have. Thank you, Thank you. I think I said the uh, seven fifty.